Okay, since it is 12.01, we are going to slowly get started. I'd like to thank the Minderu Foundation, which has provided funding for these series of webinars. And the Minderu Foundation is based in Australia and funds a lot of work on AI and XR, um, or has funded that work. Um, so we are, we also want to thank our colleagues at GW and at other organizations, including the NSF Trustworthy AI Institute for Law and Society for co-organizing this webinar. So let me introduce our speakers. Our speaker, uh, who will report on her report is Shannon Pearson. Shannon is an affiliate of the Mindrew Center for Technology and Democracy at Cambridge University. She is a digital threat investigator who has investigated online harms on social media platforms. Her research has been published in many uh, journals, including uh, reports published by Cambridge, the Institute, IEEE, the Wilson Center, and in the journal Disability and Society. We will then have feedback on the report provided by Dr. Lewis Rosenberg, who is a pioneer in the fields of augmented reality, virtual reality, and artificial intelligence. He earned his PhD from Stanford and has over 300 patents for VR, AR, and AI technologies. Um, he's currently the CEO of Unanimous AI. He is also known for many publications which I very much have benefited from, warning about the dangers to human rights of AI and XR. So Shannon, please take it away and welcome. Absolutely, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, let me just dive in, share my screen really quick. Thank you for your patience, everybody. All right, there we go. Are you able to see it? Yes? Wonderful. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Shannon. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm going to be presenting my report today uh, that I wrote with the Mindrew Center at the University of Cambridge. Uh, so just diving in. Um, Applications of virtual reality systems are poised to disrupt and to transform the global digital economy in the coming years. Uh, some forecast that the metaverse is going to grow into a 3.9 trillion pound industry by 2030. Um, XR technology has the, pe the potential to revolutionize a variety of different industries, gaming, of course, uh, but also in education and skills training, healthcare and entertainment. Um, XR systems provide opportunities to reshape the future of work and to enhance personal productivity. Um, there are so many great things that can come from this technology. However, today there are few guardrails to ensure that the development of virtual reality technologies progresses responsibly and prioritizes user safety and privacy. Um, policymakers must begin considering regulation that addresses the risks of these products. Um, and services before they enter the mainstream. If these problems become entrenched into metaverse infrastructure and business models, I argue that it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to untangle it. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to be providing you um, a, an overview and an assessment of the harms to people that I've seen manifesting today in these technologies and in social VR platforms. Uh, the presentation is going to be divided into meta, uh, metaverse platform governance, data privacy, and cybersecurity. Um, and then I will issue some recommendations for some possible interventions for policymakers and technology companies uh, to help design safer systems. So before we get started, I think it's important to lay down some definitions. Um, a term you're going to hear a lot today is XR. XR stands for extended reality. Uh, that is going to be our umbrella term for any technology that alters reality by adding a digital element onto the physical world environment to any extent. There's different extents. Uh, there's a spectrum of immersion. Uh, we have three different categories on this spectrum. The least immersive is augmented reality. Um, that's a digital overlay of, uh, of digital elements onto the physical world. Um, often through the camera of your smartphone. 
Um, AR has been around for a very long time and you've likely interacted with it. So think of Snapchat face filters, Pokemon Go. Um, but in contrast, the most immersive category is virtual reality or VR. Of course, this is exactly what we think of when we think of the metaverse. It's a fully immersive digital environment facilitated by a VR headset. Mixed reality exists somewhere in between as it is a blend of the physical world with digital elements. It allows you to manipulate and interact with elements of both the real and digital world. For example, um, I could take a virtual box um, from my real bedside table, open it um, and see what's inside. Um, MR is kind of an immersive AR and it's no longer limited to the screen of my iPhone. Rather, it comes in the form of a headset or in glasses. So what is the metaverse? Uh, the term metaverse describes a vision for the future of the internet. Um, it's a network of interconnected computer generated worlds facilitated by and accessed through XR headsets. Uh, in the metaverse, users can enter three dimensional immersive virtual spaces and interact with one, each, one another in real time to socialize, collaborate and exchange digital goods. Um, however, there's a lot of technological hurdles that must be overcome before the metaverse is fully realized. Um, it's still many years away. Um, however, this, techno uh, this technology, um, many companies like Meta, ByteDance, Microsoft, Tencent, and others have invested billions of dollars into developing the technology. Uh, comp companies like Apple and Meta push forward this notion that MR headsets could eventually replace smartphones. But looking beyond the hype, um, the metaverse continues to be defined and take shape as the technology matures and adoption increases. So while we don't have a metaverse yet, what we do have are social VR platforms, uh, which are XR apps that are focused on social networking and gaming experiences. Uh, they may be familiar to you. Some examples are Horizon Worlds, Roblox, Rec Room, VR Chat. These platforms provide a glimpse of the governance and content moderation obstacles that lie ahead for a fully realized metaverse. Um, I argue that evaluation of these harms and these challenges and governance uh, in the harms that we see today in social VR, I think can offer perspective for what is to come in a fully realized metaverse. Um, so I think that we should begin by kind of dis explaining what distinguishes social VR from social media and why we can't just copy paste solutions uh, that we deployed for social media into these three dimensional mediums. Um, social VR is distinct from social media, um, user generated content and user interactions and user um, harassment is very different um, in these respective mediums. Um, first, what constitutes generated user generated content in social VR is a far more diverse and complex compared to what we've seen on social media. It's not just two dimensional images, videos and text, rather it's three dimensional avatars, virtual objects and items, entire virtual worlds um, and user made video games. Uh, users in social VR can actively experience an immersive content environment where they can interact directly with it uh, and other people by walking around and exploring and touching virtual worlds. Um, second, the headset and the haptic gear, uh, which is a wearable device that provides feedback, like tactile feedback to simulate the sensation of touch to your body. Um, these tools engage user senses in order to give the illusion of presence in virtual environments. Um, users' physical actions get translated into the simulation, enabling them to touch and to affect objects and other users. Um, the illusion is further supported by the integration of immersive details like spatial audio, nonverbal communication cues, um, like representing your facial expressions on your avatar. It all makes it feel surprisingly real. Um, but part of what makes VR so compelling is that the simulations can elicit physiological responses. So it, that makes standing before a virtual cliff very heart pounding or climbing through an enclosed virtual space feel very claustrophobic. Um, however, the immersive nature of XR can make perceived threats to one's physical safety feel real and it's created new forms of online harassment in social VR. Um, also, user communication in social VR, um, it's physical as users can interact with each other and enter each other's personal uh, spaces. Um, harassment in social VR often manifests in the form of simulated physical behaviors intended to disturb or violate the personal space of other players. Uh, this can involve trolling beh behavior, which is like to deliberately irritate a target enough to make them leave a virtual space by like circling or stalking them. Um, that's not very 
bad necessarily, but there's more extreme cases of like simulated touching um, that are sexual in nature, and then also acting out self-harm or suicide. Um, also, lastly, user-to-user -user communication occurs primar primarily over voice chat and therefore is audio and not text-based. Um, voice chat is a notorious vector for toxic and violent hate speech and gaming, um, and voice chat use in VR creates pathways for online harassment for users in public spaces because they can often overhear the hate speech, the verbal attacks uh, happening in their vicinity. Um, repeated exposure to hate speech communicated in the voice chat feature does re represent a collective harm as it makes virtual spaces very unwelcoming for marginalized groups, and it just degrades the overall experience. So what kind of harms do we see in VR today? Um, of course, we see bullying and hate speech. It's pervasive in social VR. Racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, all forms of hate speech really do thrive in these largely unmoderated, unmonitored social spaces. Conversations do occur in real time over voice chat, uncensored without a lasting record. And the lack of rule enforcement, the anonymity afforded by the platforms and the toxic gaming culture often embolden users to spread toxicity. Um, there, consequently, social VR is kind of an, a hotbed for online vitriol, where users are target, targeted with racialized and gendered harassment and slurs based upon their voice, and then their avatars present to gender and ethnicity. Um, also, there's sexual harassment. Um, that's a widespread problem in social VR. Women commonly experience a lot of unwanted sexual communication, attention, and interactions. Some users report experiencing up to three different instances of gendered and sexualized harassment a week. Um, VR kind of brings women's bodies into virtual environments via female presenting avatars and their female sounding voices. Uh, their gender makes them targets for all this unwanted sexual attention in the form of like unwanted virtual touching, verbal threats and descriptions of rape or sexual violence, uh, and non-consensual non uh, just sexual harassment in general. Um, the harassment is immersive and some women feel report feeling very disoriented after these interactions. Uh, this harm might be compounded with the addition of haptic body gear. Uh, so for example, a 43 year old woman experienced her avatar's chest being groped in um, a first person shooter game while wearing a haptic vest. So the haptic device provided vibration feedback to her body and made the harassment feel uh, physically real. Um, so with these kinds of harms, it's kind of, if we have age, like we have these places, these, these virtual spaces are largely advertised towards and utilized by children. So social VR platforms often fail to enforce their age restrictions and ensure age appropriate spaces for children that's separate from adults. Oftentimes um, children and much older adults are occupy the same space and that's kind of where we run into problems. Um, approximately 6% of children between the ages of 5 and 10 use VR headsets very regularly. Um, and there's just very little barriers between children and adults to access these virtual social, social spaces. Uh, and it's very unmoderated and kids interact with adults, share personal information and experience uncensored bullying, hate speech, simulated sexual interactions and a lot of sexual harassment. Also, social VR is kind of shaping up into this new pathway for online sexual exploitation. Um, investigators have found that sexual predators have been capitalizing on the anonymity and access to children afforded by social VR platforms. Um, some tactics include targeting children based off of their voices, drawing children away from others and into private rooms to, and then also building trust to play games together uh, alone, and then inviting them off platform to places like Discord and, and to even meet in real life. And there's been a couple of different cases of grooming where it's translated to offline exploitation. Um, another problem is sextortion. Um, investigators have found instances of adults offering money or in-game assets like virtual currency, like Robux or items uh, to acquire real photos from children. And then once they receive the photos, they uh, threaten to reveal them. And then it kind of turns into this sextortion relationship. Those are the problems that we see now. Um, but the problems that are kind of lying in the future uh, that are developing, um, one is online extremism. So there's growing concern from state agencies about the pathways to online radicalization and online gaming. 
Uh, there is no causal link between vid video games and offline violence, but there is evidence of extremist groups increasingly using online video gaming platforms to target gaming communities to share propaganda, recruit, and mobilize young adults. While it's a very rare and nascent behavior, I would like to stress that um, some expressions of violent extremism have begun cropping up on social VR platforms. Um, so user game creation is a huge part of social VR. These platforms give players all the tools that they need to build their own video games and publish them. Um, but some egregious content has been created. Uh, for example, playable recreations of terrorism events, such as mass shootings. Um, first, play, uh, first person shooter games uh, were published on Roblox that simulated the 2019 Christchurch uh, mosque shootings in New Zealand, um, as well as the El Paso mass shooting in the US in, two, in 2019. Um, Roblox has removed these games and implemented new policies to address the problem, but still covert links to new versions continue circulating within white supremacist dark web groups. Um, additionally, live action role play is a huge part of social VR. People create games where you can reenact historical events and battles and then play with your friends online. It's very collaborative. Um, but also social VR platforms provide this channel for extremist, and danger, extremist groups and dangerous organizations to convene role-playing communities to disseminate uh, propaganda that kind of gamifies their ideology and builds community and reinforces in-group beliefs in an immersive and interactive way to young audiences. Uh, Roblox hosts, hosts ISIS-themed servers where users role-play as ISIS militants. The servers host first-person shooter game recreations of conflict zones in Iraq and Syria, where users can fight ISIS enemies with other players online. In February, uh, Singapore's National Security Agency detained two teenage boys who became radicalized on the servers for engaging in terrorist activities. Um, the young men pledged allegiance to ISIS and role played as ISIS leaders in the server and eventually plotted um, suicide bombings and stabbings in real life, um, but they were arrested. Um, so obviously it's a rare behavior, but it may grow in the future. Um, and as a digital threat investigator, what I have seen myself is white supremacist groups in the US begin exploring this um, on these social VR apps. So it's, I think it's a threat that will develop more in the future. Um, and then lastly, generative AI is going to scale content creation in the metaverse. Um, while it's really time and labor intensive to build VR experiences today, the integration of generative AI into metaverse platforms is going to speed up the creative process for users. Um, what it will look like is a user will be able to use voice or text inputs to instantly spawn virtual worlds and objects and experiences. Um, this just lowers the barrier to entry for bad actors to create experiences in VR that harm. On one hand, it's going to encourage adoption and, and make it just a, a much more creative environment, but there is a responsibility and onus on the platforms to ensure that you can't generate certain objects or in just to, to ensure that those tools are not abused. So what makes content moderation challenging in the metaverse? Um, there's a couple of reasons. Um, all conversations and visual, physical interactions between users are live and they're unfiltered and they're ephemeral, meaning that they happen really quickly and they're not often represented by a lasting digital record. It makes it really hard for platforms to monitor and detect abuse as well as prevent hate speech and harassment. Uh, the policy frameworks and content moderation regimes developed over the years to govern social media platforms and enforce rules at scale have not really translated seamlessly to virtual worlds. The automated methods that they would typically use to moderate content on social media, such as natural language processing, machine learning models, and image and video recognition software, those are all text, image, and video-based methods that are not directly applicable to immersive me uh, mediums, but they can be. It's just going to take some time to get it right. Um, some social VR platforms have begun integrating voice moderation software capable of detecting uh, toxic speech spoken in real time and escalating it to moderators. However, not all platforms use this kind of intervention to crack down on hate speech and things like that because it's really costly and it, right now it has a very low accuracy. Um, Social VR platforms enforce their rules primarily through human moderation. This generally involves having a human moderators stationed in virtual public spaces. It also relies on uh, user reporting to flag abusive interactions. These, interaction, these interventions offer really spotty coverage at best and are not really operable at scale. It, this means that social VR platforms routinely are failing to enforce, enforce their rules evenly across the platform. 
uh, this approach is kind of unsustainable for long-term growth, but also on the flip side, it's like these solutions need to be engineered for a, a new computing medium. Um, but they're going to have to pioneer these scalable content moderation techniques um, to govern the future metaphors effectively. Um, so is the online safety bill applicable to social VR? Um, it is. It establishes responsibilities for platform companies to adequately protect children from encountering illegal content in social media environments. Uh, the legislation doesn't explicitly talk about XR technology, and it wasn't drafted with the metaverse in mind, um, but social VR platforms are liable um, as service providers, user to user service providers to its duty of care obligations. Um, however, the online safety bill has a very limited definition for what content is. Um, the current definition addresses social media environments, but not uh, VR environments where you, uh, because uh, so it's like in social media environments, it's like where users are publishing and passively interacting with two-dimensional text, image, and video-based content. Um, it just doesn't encompass the full range of user-generated content and activity possible in metaverse virtual social settings. So I, I would say that it needs to be retrofitted. We need an amendment that kind of expands that definition to the kinds of things that you would actually see in XR environments. So like virtual objects, rooms, interactive games. Um, and any user generated content created uh, with generative AI. Um, and then we're gonna also go into biometric security. This is another area of threats. This is less about content moderation, but more about like what the hardware actually is processing. So XR headsets and haptic controllers are an amalgamation of- Bannon, right. Yeah. I am really sorry to interrupt you, but we need to leave enough time for Lewis and audience questions. So, I'm going to ask you to move to your recommendations. Yeah, of course. And I think that with uh, Lewis, I think that he's going to be going into a lot of the biometric data collection things. Um, so I think that that'll be OK. Let me just skip ahead. So it's kind of difficult to explain all of this. Uh, I, I do feel I explained number one. Um, so for regulators, um, I think that regulators need to be a bit more proactive. Excuse me, sorry about that. So uh, regulators, including Ofcom, I think need to be more proactive about metaverse technologies. I think that they need to dedica dedicate like accurate or, or like resources and attention to evaluating whether XR companies fully understand uh, their duty of care obligations under the online safety bill and enforce age assurance um, and also I think that they need to clarify the definitions of and how like for harassment and how they apply in a three-dimensional medium. Um, also, I think that there needs to be, uh, sorry, I'm, there's a little bit of interception. Um, so they need to provide clarification on what the expectations are uh, for active monitoring and moderation. Um, and then, for cybersecurity, I think that there needs to be more transparency reporting on data breaches, cyber vulnerabilities in the products, because there are many incidences of financial fraud related to transactions of virtual assets, um, biometric and biometrically inferred data categories. Um, I think that we also need to strengthen existing consumer protection laws to prevent provisions that specifically cover NFTs and other digital assets in metaverse environments. And then uh, lastly, governments and industry must commit to embedding security and privacy by design into metaverse products and services um, and implore companies to practice privacy by design um, and minimize the amount of personal information that they do gather. So I'm so sorry I couldn't get through the whole presentation, guys, but uh, I'm going to hand it off to Lewis. Thank you, Shannon. Lewis? All right, I'm going to share my screen. All right, can you see that okay? And let me remind people while before Lewis begins, please put your questions in the Q&A and that's the first thing we're gonna to turn to. So um, I wanna start off by saying that that uh, Shannon and I agree on uh, the vast majority of, of risks in, uh, in XR metaverse environments. And uh, I think she gave a great, uh, a great overview of really the wide spectrum of risks. Uh, what I want to focus on and what I uh, really specialize in 
is are, are the risks that, that emerge when we combine the emerging power of, of artificial intelligence with XR technologies. And so I want to just talk for 10 minutes about um, the AI powered metaverse and, and how uh, it can enable a, a really, really dangerous tool of persuasion. Um, a, a few quick words about myself. I, I've been involved in, uh, in VR, AR, and, and AI for, for over 30 years. Uh, started in, in VR back at Stanford and, and NASA, working in, in research labs. And then I went to Air Force Research uh, Laboratory, where I uh, built the first mixed reality system. Uh, it's a picture of me in 1992, before my hair went gray, working on mixed reality at the Air Force. And, and then I also worked in, in, uh, in industry, so I understand the constraints. Uh, I, I founded Immersion Corporation, one of the early VR companies, a uh, company we took public in 1999, uh, the first VR company to go public, and then uh, founded Outland Research, an augmented reality company acquired by Google. And currently, I, I run a company called Unanimous AI, which is an artificial intelligence company. And, and I'm also the chief scientist of a group called the Responsible Metaverse Alliance that focuses on policy. So uh, I, I've kind of seen this from, from all perspectives, research industry and, and policy, and um, and I want to talk about one of the dangers, again, that, that is um, often not understood well enough by policymakers. I give a few definitions to start. When I talk about the metaverse, I really talk about it in very uh, high level sense as uh, interactive computing environments where groups of users um, have shared immersive experiences in virtual or augmented worlds. Uh, so really uh, VR, mixed reality, AR, uh, I want to define generative AI, which are large-scale AI systems that can produce really human consumable content at a professional quality. And we're familiar with documents, videos, audio, but these uh, these systems will be able to generate immersive experiences at scale, as Shannon mentions as well. And then I want to talk about conversational AI, which uh, is, is potentially one of the most dangerous pieces that will enter into these environments, which are artificial agents that can engage in flowing and coherent dialogue with human users. Uh, and keep track of the conversational context and the informational goals. And, and I want to point out conversational AI as something that we've kind of thought we had for a decade when we talked to Siri and Alexa, and that was not conversational. You issue a command and Alexa or Siri responds. Where we are right now with conversational systems is they can engage in real conversations, real dialogue, keeping track of context, even probing you for more, more information. And that really changes a lot of things, both in, um, in 2D worlds and in especially in immersive worlds. So why is the metaverse dangerous? Uh, I would say, first and foremost, it's not the technology that we should fear. It's the power that metaverse platforms could have over the lives of ordinary people. And the best way to think of it is when you enter an immersive environment, you are potentially giving a third party the ability to track and profile everything you do. And, and I'll go into this in more detail, but I, I really mean everything and, and track it in real time and give you the power, this third party, the power to modify the world around you at their discretion. So, so if that doesn't make you nervous, it should, because this is the first time in history that you would be able to enter an, a world, an environment, and some third party, a corporation or state actor, can track and profile everything that you and everybody else does and then change the world around you as they see fit. And with the power of generative AI, they can make those modifications at scale in ways that can be used for targeted influence, uh, targeting people on an individual basis. So the potential is really, really dangerous. Why do we have to worry about uh, people uh, using these tools to, to influence people at scale? Well. The most likely reason at, at, in, in the near term is that most of these companies that are developing uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality platforms uh, already have influence business models. These are already players in, uh, in social media, players in search engines, and their entire business is generally based on influence business models, which means they are already experts on tracking and profiling users in social media, uh, in search engines, and then using the profiles that they develop to, to enable selling targeted influence, selling uh, advertisers the ability to, to segment populations and target people as narrowly as possible because that's how they compete for value. And it's a, it's actually a pretty vicious feedback loop where uh, the better they get at targeting and profiling users, the better they get at selling targeted influence, and uh, and it becomes the business model that they, that they grow and amplify. And in an AI-powered metaverse, which is real-time, real-time 
which makes it so different than today's platforms, this optimized influence can actually happen during during live interactions with with humans. So let's look at each of these uh, closely, tracking and profiling users. We're familiar in social platforms that you can track where people click, what they buy, who their friends are. And just with that information, extreme amounts of uh, extreme amounts of targeting can happen. In the metaverse, when you enter a virtual or augmented world, the platform can track where you go, what you do, who you're with, what you look at, how long your gaze lingers on different things, and even track your gait and your posture. So imagine you're walking down the walking through uh, down the street in a virtual or augmented world, um, and you slow down and you look into a store window. Um, the platform could potentially track uh, where do, where did you slow down. What window did you look in? Where in the window drew your attention? How long you looked, and and potentially um, how your posture is infer is uh, revealing your emotion and interest. So that's an extreme amount of 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 uh, information in one little interaction, and there'll be thousands of those interactions throughout your experience. Uh, uh, headsets right now can also monitor your facial expressions. Uh, to infer your emotions in real time, very subtly from your from your facial expressions, even expressions that humans couldn't detect, but but the system can detect, can also monitor your vocal inflections to infer emotions, and monitor your vital signs. We're familiar with vital sign monitoring in smartwatches that's being transitioned into headsets, into earbuds, and these systems very likely, uh, and some already do, can tr will track your heart rate, respiration rate, blood pressure, and pupil dilation. So these systems will be able to track and profile exactly how you act throughout your day continuously and um, and be able to track and profile exactly how you feel during each and every one of these interactions. This uh, This is really dangerous. They'll monitor your whole life, what you do say, experience, and feel. And with that data, if they are allowed to store that data over time, um, they'll be able to build behavioral models. And so uh, behavioral predictive AI models for you as an individual so they can predict exactly what you're most likely to do in every situation because they have this history of exactly what you did uh, with all this data. In addition, they'll be able to generate emotional models if they can store this data, which is a predictive AI system that will be able to predict how you will react in a large number of situations, even situations that they manufacture by changing the world around you. What will they use this profound ability for? Uh, I think for selling targeted influence. Uh, in metaverse platforms, advertising and propaganda is not going to be flat advertisements and videos like we have on social media today. Advertising and propaganda are going to be immersive experiences that change the world around you for promotional purposes. And they'll be able to adapt these in real time uh, based on your real time emotions and behaviors. So, so let me just give you like an example. So say, say I'm walking down the city street, virtual or augmented, and uh, I'm in the metaverse, and I pass a young couple in this uh, in this virtual world having a conversation about uh, some new movie they just went to, or a new car that they just bought, or um, and I just overhear 20 seconds of their conversation, right? And then our paths diverge. Now I'm influenced by hearing that exchange. Uh, I believe it to be an authentic encounter of other people in this world. What I don't realize is that you know that was a targeted promotional experience that was injected into my world, into my surroundings, on behalf of a third-party sponsor, and I would call this an example of a virtual product placement. Uh, highly targeted. Only I saw that virtual couple. Other people in that same spot saw something else. It was designed for me. Uh, the age, gender, ethnicity, clothing, speaking style of that couple was all chosen by AI and generated by generative AI in real time to maximize its promotional influence on me based on profile data that it's been collecting on me over time. And even the dialogue between that couple as they talk about uh, the movie they went to or, or talk about this new car, the dialogue could be custom crafted for me based on my personal interests, my values, my personality, my interaction history. And so this could deeply influence me because I think it's authentic. And without guardrails, I might never really know that it was a targeted promotional experience. And because this is the metaverse and this is real time, while I'm walking behind this couple, the platform is also monitoring my gaze direction. It's monitoring my pupil dilation. And so as soon as I start paying attention to that couple, the platform knows. 
And so it can sense changes in my behavior, changes in my physiology while I listen to this couple. And so maybe when they're talking about a new movie and, 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 and they mention an actor that I like, maybe my heart rate increases a little bit. And so they now talk more about that actor. But then when they mention it's a horror film, maybe my heart rate slows because maybe I don't really like horror films. And so they quickly adapt the conversation. So now they say, well, it's really not a scary movie. It's more sci-fi. And the point is, in the AI-powered metaverse, I could become an unwilling participant in this promotional conversation that's adapting its tactics based on my real-time reactions without me even saying a word. And so that's the power of immersive targeted influence. It will be subtle experiences that that are not pop-up ads or videos, and it won't just be for product marketing. It could be for propaganda, ideology, disinformation, anything. Um, and of course, it doesn't have to just be me overhearing a conversation. So I could be in a virtual coffee shop and a person sitting next to me could actually strike up a conversation. And I could think it's another, com another customer, but it could actually be a virtual spokesperson. An AI-generated avatar looks like everybody else, but it's controlled by AI, generative, and it has a promotional agenda. And, um, and it draws me into a promotional conversation that subtly promotes a product or service that some third party wants to influence me about. And it could be very skilled. It will have complete access to my interests and hobbies and purchasing history. And it will be monitoring my facial expressions, my vocal inflections, my pupil dilation. So it could adjust its conversational tactics to maximize its influence on me. And, and so really, like, what chance do I have as an average consumer not to be influenced by an AI spokesperson that's trained on persuasive tactics and has access to my blood pressure in real time. I have no chance. I will be influenced. I'll be persuaded far more than any, any human could do. So immersive influence, AI powered, extremely dangerous. Two, two major categories are virtual product placements, uh, targeted experiences that inject into your world, or virtual spokespeople, AI controlled avatars that actually engage you in promotional conversation. Uh, and adjust their tactics in real time based on your behavioral and emotional reactions. Uh, and these systems will be able to pitch you and influence you more skillfully than any salesperson, uh, even on misinformation or disinformation. And there are not protections in place. Um, and so to sum up, uh, the metaverse uh, with the power of AI, I believe, uh, has the potential to be the most dangerous tool of persuasion and manipulation that we've created uh, as a technology to date. Again, can track everything you do and feel, generate de detailed behavioral and emotional profiles, alter the world around you, potentially without you even knowing it, engage you in conversation, potentially without you realizing that it's an AI you're engaged in, and adjust their tactics in real time based on not just what you say, but actually the emotions that you express uh, while you're interacting. So do we need guardrails? I think we do. Uh, I think there's lots of guardrails that are needed, but the ones that I worry the most about are the ones that policymakers understand the least, which is the fact that interactive forms of targeted influence is not something we've ever dealt with before at scale, especially not when it's immersive and mediated by AI. So uh, I agree uh, with Shannon, the metaverse is going to happen. It's going to transform society. It will likely happen over the next 10 years. And I think now is the time that we all need to push for solutions, um, especially when we're looking at both AI and metaverse combined. Thank you, Lewis and Shannon. We really appreciate it. Okay, we're going to move to the questions in the Q&A, and I urge you to add your questions to the Q&A. So let's begin. Um, Meg has a question as to whether or not anyone has studied health disinformation in uh, virtual reality or in virtual worlds. Anybody know of any such studies? Okay, um, so we we don't know of such studies, but we do know, and you probably have done this work, Meg, um, of disinformation using AI. So you can imagine how much more that could be in the metaverse. Okay, next question is about terminology and just, you know, we're talking about virtual worlds, David is saying, but um, there's no uh, interoperability of these various worlds. And so when we talk about the metaverse or virtual worlds, it's very inexact and we don't know which one, et cetera. Do you have any thoughts about this? Shannon? I think you're on mute, Shannon. 
Thanks. No, we, we're not hearing you. Louis, do you want to give it a try till she, we lost How about you? now? Yay, there you go. Great, go ahead, okay, Sam. yeah, so sorry about that. Um, no, the thing is, uh, you're totally right. Uh, there are a lot of different governance frameworks that are being like suggested. Like we don't know if it's gonna be like a multiverse where there's different platforms and they control different worlds or if it's gonna be like, uh, like a centralized system where it's like it's all run by one platform and they're kind of the gatekeeper or if it's going to be decentralized um completely where uh there is no like overseeing governance party it's like where everybody who is a participant in that world like buys virtual land and then has a stake and there's like no central governance so right now it's like th these platforms are just arising so it's, it's kind of difficult for us to like put a um a firm definition yet because I, I mean these platforms are only a couple of years old so I think that we'll know in the next couple of years kind of what form it's taking but right now it's still taking shape I predict Thank more you. of a multiverse kind of setup where there's separate uh, could platforms. you so could I you will... define that Shannon the multiverse versus the Metaverse. A multiverse, it's it's kind of like what we have right now with social media platforms. It's like say for like Facebook, it's its own entity. Um, and it's governed by its own rules. And then you have another, like you have TikTok and it's its own separate entity has its own rules. So I think that those platforms that we see might transfer over. So, Thanks, so I, would Lewis. With, I would agree with that. And, and I'd say it's, it's, there's a lot of influencers out there trying to say that it's going to be not that, that it's all going to be interoperable and it's all going to be based on blockchain. And it's usually because people have, it's really usually promoted by people who have a vested interest in uh, in blockchain technologies, which which blockchain technologies are great. And I, I but um, uh, to me, it's really wishful thinking that uh, just because the existence of the ability to have distributed uh, data storage and, and, and other distributed technologies is going to make uh, all the major corporations in the world completely change their business models. And, uh, and all of the companies that are currently building metaverse platforms um, have centralized business models. They, they leverage uh, uh, controlling their brand, controlling their customers uh, by having centralized platforms. Uh, there's no evidence that there's that the, that the world's going to go away from that anytime soon, and so it will be very much like social media, where yeah, you can you can uh, post a Twitter link on Facebook, but that's interoperability. <laughs> Those are still two different, very different worlds, and um, and centralized platform. You know, the first metaverse platform uh, was built in 1995, uh, Active Worlds, and uh, and there've been lots of platforms over you know the last almost 30 years. And they've all been centralized platforms. There's and so uh, I think regulators and policymakers need to assume that there's going to be uh, large corporations controlling uh, controlling platforms uh, and potentially uh, exploiting platforms. And uh, and we're not going to be saved by blockchain. And if we do, great. Uh, regulators put some policy in place that maybe becomes extinct. But I, I think we have to assume uh, corporate control. Given that, although some governments are positing models for uh, metaverse governance, the EU, as example, held uh, these democratic uh, hearings to educate people about potential issues and then ask them about policy, which was an interesting approach. Um, do you think we need global governance in response, a shared treaty, and we should be starting on that now? I am of the opinion that, I mean, I think it's good to have conversations about what do we want these platforms to look like, but I do think that we don't know what they really will look like. Um, so I think it's kind of too early. I think that what we should worry about is the biometric data collection and to start establishing rules around that. And that should be a global conversation because, I mean, if these companies are investing so much money, governments are investing so much money into adopting these technologies, is it will likely be integrated into education, healthcare training, so many different industries. We have to set up guardrails around this biometric data collection and to establish limits on like what can be inferred. Because especially for like, say for emotion recognition, that, it, it's not these these systems aren't foolproof, you know. And also, there's different cultural 
perspectives on that. Like we've we've seen like for facial recognition, them like scientists trying to derive like uh, your mood from your facial expression that varies across different cultural divides. And then also a lot of this data is it, it is indicative of health conditions. So it's it, like ADHD, personality disorders. So it's just it's really sensitive data. And who is it being shared with? Can it be anonymized? Um, and how long is it being retained? And I think that these are the rules that need to be set in place, and that should be the first point of conversation. I just want to comment on that, which is that um, the word biometric is actually really being pushed by industry as a way to avoid regulation, uh, because biometric, bi you know, biometric data, especially in policy, generally refers to data being used for, to personally identify people, uh, facial scans, fingerprint data is really what biometrics is. And, and that is, and yes, we need to protect privacy of people through biometrics, but the real dangers in my mind is, um, is physiological data and emotion recognition. And it generally, uh, what I've seen in talking to, to large corporations that they'll, they'll make these statements saying, oh, don't worry, biometric data never leaves our headset. And what they really mean is your identity never leaves your headset. What they don't mean is that your facial reactions, your emotions, they're leaving the headset, they have to. And so they're using the word biometric as a way to avoid regulation because that word really means identity. And, I, and so I think regulators and policymakers really need to speak specifically about uh, behavioral privacy and emotional privacy and not allow the word biometric to confuse the issue because if there is any confusion, then it gets exploited by, um, by the industry that's trying to not be regulated. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. That's I interesting that you would say that because we, we recently did a study of XR policies in six countries and um, <laughs> only one of them is actually paying attention to these kind of issues. So there you go. Okay, um, you were going to say something, Shannon. I interrupted you. I think no. Did, did okay. Next question. What do you think of the Apple Vision Pro allowing a, AR, VR immersion? Do you think there could be negative or positive impact or future harms in social VR for children? Could you could you repeat the beginning of the question? Sorry. No, so they're really asking about future harms in social VR for children that use, for example, the Apple Vision Pro? Um, well, uh, the Apple Vision Pro is hosting social VR platforms. So the, the problems that we see on social VR platform, like basically, it, I would say that the, the problems that I kind of listed before, where uh, these social VR platforms are, are not really, they're kind of sparsely populated right now, um, it, depending on which platform you're on. And it kind of makes it difficult to have a populated room where you have children and it, like it, children and adults are just kind of grouped together at this moment in time. Um, so I, I think that the risks that we'll see are obviously grooming, obviously children getting exposed to uh, egregious content that they're unprepared for because they're in environments with adults. Um, I would also say sextortion that is happening right now. Um, uh, as I kind of explained earlier, um, and I think that children kind of just being exposed to that like toxic gaming environment where the voice chat is uncensored and you have it just like it just kind of breeds toxicity. So kind of ensuring that these environments are positive for kids and um, kind of making it uh, fit for purpose uh, is kind of the right way to go at this moment in time. So I'd like to add to that. So I agree with all that. And those are all really important issues uh, for protecting kids. I think the issues are, um, are, are at least fairly well understood by regulators because it, they, they exist those issues exist in online online immersive gaming right now. They exist in places like Roblox or or Minecraft. Like those, um, the the it, some new dangers that I worry a lot about are these manipulative dangers that I talked about um, because children are even more susceptible to them. And so you can imagine if you're in an immersive world like Roblox and you're a kid, uh, you already have a harder time telling the difference between uh, authentic content and marketing. 
Uh, now, when it becomes when those boundaries become blurred, you're, you're even more susceptible. So imagine you're a kid in an immersive environment, and a big giant teddy bear avatar comes up to you and befriends you, and it's really an AI generated uh, creation. And it's talking to you about how you know you should convince your parents to buy you this particular new brand of cereal. Um, you know that will be extremely, uh, extremely powerful form of influence. And again, same techniques could be used for misinformation, disinformation, uh, and so uh, and with AI, it can be deployed at, at scale. So um, I personally think that immersive advertising. Uh, conversational advertising should be banned on children uh, below a certain age um, where uh, they already have a hard time. And it's a concern because some platforms like Roblox actually already started uh, immersive advertising. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think we it's not, the dangers aren't even studied well enough for, for this to just go ahead without realizing that the, the level of influence that immersive advertising could have on kids. Um, it's like all the, all the, the studies that were done in the seventies on, you know, cartoon advertising and TV advertising on kids needs to be replicated for immersive advertising for us to really understand how dangerous it is. And in direct response to that, um, someone asked our existing advertising disclosure guidelines could they tackle this just by disclosure? So it's 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 an unclear issue, especially if you look at like the rules around um, like product placements in movies. Are product placements in movies have pretty loose uh, restrictions? Uh, and I, I mean, maybe that's reasonable because it's you know it is just a static uh, or canned thing put into a put into a movie, but. When you're doing product placements in an immersive world and they're interactive, it becomes something different. And so I think that like just the it's it's not clear where the boundaries are even when we go into this new media. Mm -hmm. And it's like it's also playable. So like right now with Roblox, it's like it, basically you can like hop into a portal and it'll take you to an immersive environment where it's like a Coca-Cola ad. So you're playing games and you're like interacting with the ad and that's kind of the direction it's gone. And I mean, like that has existed on computer like games like Club Penguin and Pop Tropica on the past. So it's like, you just have to gauge like, is it really that influential on a child's behavior to buy an ad? But the thing is it's immersive. It's just a different environment entirely. And it, and it will become conversational, uh, which I think it will be even and again, the conversations will be adaptive. So, um, you know, kids are going to be basically having conversations with advertisements, unless there's rules that say you can't. <laughs> so. Um, so um, X person here says, sort of disagrees with this argument and says, it seems the current problems are things that are already prohibited in the real world, like grooming. Um, it would be better if we make users regulate prohibitive behavior by themselves um, or we, uh, by introducing technological methods that limit some degree of freedom. So what about regulating specific settings? Uh, for example, um, uh, device settings like users can only touch each other in the metaverse when they can make consent. What do you mm -hmm. think of that? I mean, building in these kinds of uh, design features that enable a person to like customize their experience in the metaverse has worked. So like for Horizon Worlds, like they've implemented uh, boundaries, like uh, a boundary setting. So you, you can allow someone to not come into your zone. Also, like when you try and touch someone, that person immediately disappears. And uh, so these kinds of design interventions have made it a much more positive uh, like environment. And I think that we're going to be kind of playing that cat and mouse game of like how we see these threat behaviors, they're bad, and then kind of redesigning. Um, but it's going to have to be this partnership between policy people, safety people, and then uh, UX designers and engineers. I think I would agree with that. And I think that there are, there are simple solutions that can solve many of these issues and they might need to be enforced so that they so that uh that the platforms have to do this but one you know one policy that i think would be um really significant is requiring that 
uh, AI controlled avatars look visually different than avatars controlled by humans. So you can at least know if you're talking to another user or if you're talking to an artificial agent that potentially has, you know, has a promotional agenda. Uh, if they look different, uh, at least you, at least you as an adult can leverage uh, skepticism and, and put, put it in the proper context. I think even if they look different, a kid might, a child might not be able to to uh, put it in the proper context. But I think, in, you know, in the metaverse, we're blurring the boundaries between what's virtual and what's real, and where AI will also, you know, what what is a person and what's an AI. Uh, these you know, we're very close to those boundaries being invisible. Um, this is not we're not talking five years away. We're talking like with large language models, AI driven avatars are of this nature that are indistinguishable or less than 18 months away. Right. And I would also say that um, in my in my report, I also propose monitoring. Like we need to define what is active monitoring, because I think that companies are kind of getting away with like not really sufficiently monitoring their platforms or only monitoring the public, like the like the main horizon world's room or like the main rooms where it because it's it's such a diverse environment where like people create their own games and then they're in and they're playing like a 30 minute game with a stranger with the voice mic on. And I think that if you don't monitor bad th new things that you never anticipated could happen. For example, like I was just, last week I was doing some research in the metaverse and um, basically what you were able to do is you're able to stream a video and it was porn in front of all of these children. So it's like these kinds of ways that people are trolling each other or like basically it's like you can save photos to your device and like people were handing out porn. So it's, it's just like these are new, these are always, the problems we've always had. <laughs> they're just in a completely like spatial medium. So it's like there needs to be monitoring because then you don't know if it happens. Um, and but, but the pro the reality is corporations can't monitor every room. And they can't interact. They, 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 and I mean, so AI will give them abilities to to do monitoring at scale. Now you have privacy problems as well. So so there's this going to be this tension between um, between you know. AI monitoring at scale and, and privacy, but um, yeah. I'm gonna challenge you on that, Lewis, though. AI monitoring of social networks has been truly inadequate. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's disturbing. Um, I love this question. Is there an education course in primary school or beyond to help consumers understand these concerns. With awareness, consumers may take an active role as opposed to passive behavioral market AI controlled. I have a quick response to that, which is um, there, there's not a lot out there to educate the public. Um, and there needs to be more. Uh, I just was part of a project that was also funded by Minderu to create a short film, a three minute film uh, called Privacy Lost. People can find it at privacyloss.org. And it shows a vision of you know, the near future of how AI powered metaverse could influence people in, in subtle ways, uh, in the hope of helping the public realize that these dangers are coming, and, and then hoping the public will put pressure on, uh, on regulators to, to protect, to, to put protections in place. Yep. Um... These issues of data governance are what the hub is obsessed with and essentially, you know, um, what we are calling consumer protections or data protections are really difficult. You know, no nation really knows what they're doing here. And if consumers were more educated, that would be very, very helpful. We need a primer. Um, this question, I'm not sure I understand, but this will be our last question. Do you agree with the view that conformity of actors on these platforms can only be assured when there is, in addition to state surveillance, a multi-control system of act actors? And that means users, owners of platforms, requirements for consultation, transparency. Um, I wouldn't advocate for state surveillance. Um, I would probably not recommend that. But I do think that you need to have platforms. Um, I think that there need to be hiring of investigators to kind of 
detect these threat behaviors. Um, I think that there definitely needs to be collaboration. We saw that like with social media, opening up portions of your platform so that it, re researchers can kind of investigate the threats as they come up and to learn more about them, like uh, through open APIs and things like that. Um, I do think that there needs to be obligations for monitoring though, definitely, and transparency. Um, because I think that there needs to be transparency about like what data can be inferred, what are they inferring, who are they, are they sharing it with, um, and then how much, how, what are the resources that they're devoting? So I think that the online safety bill has transparency requirements and kind of expanding those could be really good. And also for the cybersecurity vulnerabilities that are inherent in these devices. Louis, do you wanna add anything? I think there's one other facet, which is uh, identity and, and persistent identity. Um, you know, uh, most of these really bad behaviors, user on user bad behaviors are a result of anonymity or the ability of people to have multiple uh, multiple different accounts and hide, between, hide behind things. Uh, if there was a you know, requirement for persistent identity, meaning your identity follows you, <laughs> Uh, in in these virtual worlds, people would behave better. They don't behave, these same people don't behave the same way in the real world because they have persist, persistent identity. It, there's a tension though between privacy and persistent identity. So it, to me, actually, maybe the single biggest challenge in figuring out how to make the metaverse a, a safe place uh, because privacy is also important. And so there needs to be solutions that mean, that protect people's privacy but also allow you as a person when you're engaging with somebody to know that they really are who you think they are and 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 have an, and that they feel responsible for their actions which they don't if they're anonymous. Shannon, do you want to add anything? Um I definitely uh, agree on some points. I do think that like making sure that you can authenticate that like this is human and then being able to label like this is this is an AI, this is not human is important. I do think that privacy needs to be preserved in the metaverse. So I wouldn't say that like, it, there's been conversations about like on social media, you need to verify your real identity with your ID. I think that that's a bad idea just because I, I think that we can design a metaverse where um, your privacy is preserved because I mean like, you don't want all of your behavior to be tied to your personal identity. So if there is a way between, um, if there's a middle ground, I think that we can find it. Uh, it's just going to take some tinkering and uh, I think uh, some stakeholders coming together and discussing. As the EU did. Yes. Yes. Well, hopefully that will happen. Thank you so much, both of you, for your thoughtful analysis of these issues and um, I hope everybody in the audience will continue to engage on these issues. And our next webinar will be with Dr. Anu Bradford on August 9th on her new book about governance of technology, data-driven technologies, and differences between the U.S. and the EU. So please join us for that. We'll send that out soon. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again for our speakers. And everybody have a great day.